Today is day four for the Come Follow Me study for this week, October 28th through November 3rd. I would that I could persuade all to repent. Mormon 1 through 6. Thursday, October 31st, 2024, Mormon 3. Mormon cries repentance unto the Nephites. They gain a great victory and glory in their own strength. Mormon refuses to lead them, and his prayers for them are without faith. The Book of Mormon invites the twelve tribes of Israel to believe the gospel. About 360 to 362 A.D. Mormon cries repentance, but to no avail. Mormon 3, 1 through 2. And it came to pass that the Lamanites did not come to battle again until ten years more had passed away. And behold, I had employed my people the Nephites in preparing their lands and their arms against the time of battle. And it came to pass that the Lord did say unto me, Cry unto this people, Repent ye, and come unto me, and be baptized, and build up again my church, and ye shall be spared. Mormon observed that the Nephites did not acknowledge the ways that the Lord had blessed them. As you read Mormon 3, 3 and 9, you might ponder how you are acknowledging God's influence in your life. Inviting your children to list or draw pictures of some things they are grateful for might be a good way to help them feel gratitude for God. After they have made a list, you could read Mormon 3, 3 and 9. Mormon 3, 3. And I did cry unto this people. Elder Marion G. Romney said, We who today bear the priesthood of God are the legal heirs to this great commission. Ours is the responsibility of officially declaring repentance unto all the inhabitants of the earth. None are exempt. We must discharge this responsibility, regardless of the manner in which our message is received. President Joseph Fielding Smith said, that is our duty. When we see evil lurking, when we see dangers confronting the people, and especially the Latter-day Saints, it is our duty to raise the warning voice, and not only in behalf of the Latter-day Saints, but to warn all people, for our mission is one that is worldwide, and we should warn all men and give them the opportunity of repentance, of serving the Lord and keeping his commandments if they will. If they will not, then we have saved our souls. We are clear from the blood of this generation. That is our duty. Mormon 3.3 3 continued, But it was in vain, and they did not realize that it was the Lord that had spared them, and granted unto them a chance for repentance. And behold, they did harden their hearts against the Lord their God. How can you recognize the Lord's influence in your life? Mormon 3.4-9 and it came to pass that after this tenth year had passed away, making in the whole three hundred and sixty years from the coming of Christ, the king of the Lamanites sent an epistle unto me, which gave unto me to know that they were preparing to come again to battle against us. And it came to pass that I did cause my people that they should gather themselves together at the land desolation, to a city which was in the borders by the narrow pass which led to the land southward. And there we did place our armies that we might stop the armies of the Lamanites, that they might not get possession of any of our lands. Therefore we did fortify against them with all our force. And it came to pass that in the three hundred and sixty and first year, the Lamanites did come down to the land of desolation to battle against us. And it came to pass that in that year, we did beat them, insomuch that they did return to their own lands again. And in the three hundred and sixty and second year, they did come down again to battle. And we did beat them again, and did slay a great number of them, and their dead were cast into the sea. And now because of this great thing which my people, the Nephites, had done, they began to boast in their own strength, and began to swear before the heavens that they would avenge themselves of the blood of their brethren who had been slain by their enemies. Heavenly Father had blessed the Nephites too, but they had not recognized it. What can we do to show... We are thankful to Heavenly Father for our blessings. Elder Neil A. Maxwell cautioned us to recognize Heavenly Father's power instead of our own. Before enjoying the harvest of righteous efforts, let us therefore first acknowledge God's hand. Before enjoying the harvest of righteous efforts, let us therefore first acknowledge God's hand. Otherwise, the rationalizations appear and they include... My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. Or we vaunt ourselves, as ancient Israel would have done, except for Gideon's deliberately small army, by boasting that mine own hand has saved me. Touting our own hand 
makes it doubly hard to confess God's hand in all things. What blessings come when you acknowledge His influence? What are the consequences of not acknowledging Him? Mormon 3, 10 through 11. And they did swear by the heavens and also by the throne of God that they would go up to battle against their enemies and would cut them off from the face of the earth. And it came to pass that I, Mormon, did utterly refuse from this time forth to be a commander and a leader of this people because of their wickedness and abominations. In spite of Mormon leading his people for approximately 35 years, at this point he refused to lead them. Mormon must have been influenced by the abridgment he was making of the Book of Mormon. He saw Captain Moroni's and Helaman's justifiable reasons to go to war, defending their lands, houses, wives, children, rights, privileges, liberty, and ability to worship. He taught the people these purposes of war. After seeing the motivation the Nephites in his day had for fighting the Lamanites to avenge themselves, and that they began to boast in their own strength, and that they were guilty of great wickedness and abominations, he temporarily refused to lead their armies. Mormon 3.12 Behold, I had led them. Notwithstanding their wickedness, I had led them many times to battle, and had loved them according to the love of God which was in me. With all my heart and my soul had been poured out in prayer unto my God all the day long for them. Nevertheless, it was without faith, because of the hardness of their hearts. How did Mormon feel about the people around him? What can you do to develop the kind of love he had? When he was in the presiding bishopric, Bishop Glenn L. Pace admonished us to strive to emulate the love Mormon exhibited. This prophet had Christ-like love for a fallen people. Can we be content with loving less? We must press forward with the pure love of Christ to spread the good news of the gospel. As we do so, and fight the war of good against evil, light against darkness, and truth against falsehood, we must not neglect our responsibility of dressing the wounds of those who have fallen in battle. There is no room in the kingdom for fatalism. Mormon 3, 13-16 And thrice have I delivered them out of the hands of their enemies, and they have repented not of their sins. And when they had sworn by all that had been forbidden them by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that they would go up unto their enemies to battle and avenge themselves of the blood of their brethren, behold, the voice of the Lord came unto me, saying, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay. And because this people repented not after I had delivered them, behold, they shall be cut off from the face of the earth. And it came to pass that I utterly refused to go up against mine enemies, and I did, even as the Lord had commanded me, and I did stand as an idle witness to manifest unto the world the things which I saw and heard, according to the manifestations of the Spirit, which had testified of things to come. Stop! I did cry unto this people. But it was in vain, and they did not realize that it was the Lord that had spared them, and granted unto them a chance for repentance. And it came to pass that the king of the Lamanites sent an epistle unto me, that they were preparing to come again to battle against us. Word. And we did beat them. And now, because of this great thing which my people had done, they began to boast in their own strength. did utterly refuse from this time forth to be a commander and a leader of this people because of their wickedness and abomination. I swear by the throne of God that we will cut our enemies from off the face of this land! I have
had led them and had loved them according to the love of God which was in me with all my heart. And my soul had been poured out in prayer unto my God all the day long for them. Nevertheless, it was without faith because of the hardness of their hearts. And I did stand as an idle witness to manifest unto the world the things which I saw and heard. When the Nephites began to boast in their own strength and began to swear before the heavens that they would avenge themselves of the blood of their brethren, who had been slain by their enemies, Mormon refused to command them any more. Like ether of an earlier day, Mormon began to stand as an idle witness to manifest unto the world the things which he saw and heard. He had led the Nephites and had loved them and had prayed earnestly for them all the day long. But he refused to follow them into even greater wickedness. Self-defense and vengeance are not the same. The Lord sometimes justifies his people in fighting to defend their homes and families from attack, but he does not justify offensive war. The Lord said, vengeance is mine and I will repay. It is God who deals out retribution unto men. In taking the offensive, the Nephites went off to battle without the sanction of the Lord, which resulted in the eventual destruction of an entire nation. Though Mormon couldn't teach his people because of the hardness of their hearts, he tried to teach future readers to learn from history and avoid the terrible mistakes his people had made. Mormon's words to go forth to the Gentiles and the house of Israel. Mormon 3, 17 through 19. Therefore I write unto you Gentiles, and also unto you house of Israel, when the work shall commence, that ye shall be about to prepare to return to the land of your inheritance. Yea, behold, I write unto all the ends of the earth, yea, unto you twelve tribes of Israel, who shall be judged according to your works by the twelve whom Jesus chose to be his disciples in the land of Jerusalem. And I write also unto the remnant of this people, who shall also be judged by the twelve whom Jesus chose in this land, and they shall be judged by the other twelve whom Jesus chose in the land of Jerusalem. Elder Spencer J. Condy said, questions are sometimes raised regarding the relationship between the twelve apostles in the land of Jerusalem and the twelve disciples whom Jesus chose from among the Nephites. Mormon makes it clear that the twelve tribes of Israel are to be judged by the twelve in Jerusalem. The remnant of Lehi will be judged by the twelve Nephite disciples, and they in turn shall be judged by the other twelve whom Jesus chose in the land of Jerusalem. Mormon 3.20 And these things doth the Spirit manifest unto me. Therefore I write unto you all. And for this cause I write unto you that ye may know that ye must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, yea, every soul who belongs to the whole human family of Adam. And ye must stand to be judged of your works, whether they be good or evil. President Dallin H. Oaks of the First Presidency explained, The final judgment is not just an evaluation of a sum total of good and evil acts, what we have done. It is an acknowledgement of the final effect of our acts and thoughts, what we have become. It is not enough for anyone just to go through the motions. The commandments, ordinances, and covenants of the gospel are not a list of deposits required to be made in some heavenly account. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a plan that shows us how to become what our Heavenly Father desires us to become. Elder Bruce McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that others would take part in our judgment. The reality is that there will be a whole hierarchy of judges who under Christ shall judge the righteous. He alone shall issue the decrees of damnation for the wicked. The scriptures teach that there will be at least five sources who will take part on judgment day. One, ourselves, two, our bishops, three, scriptures, four, apostles, five, Jesus Christ. President John Taylor further elaborated on the role of the apostles in our judgment. Christ is at our head. It would seem to be quite reasonable if the twelve apostles in Jerusalem are to be the judges of the twelve tribes, and the twelve disciples on this continent are to be the judges of the descendants of Nephi, that the brother of Jared and Jared should be the judges of the Jaredites, their descendants, and further, that the first presidency and twelve who have officiated in our age should operate in regard to mankind in this dispensation. President Heber C. Kimball said, Brother Joseph Smith many a time said to Brother Brigham and myself and to others that he was a representative of God to us, to teach and direct us and reprove the wrongdoers. 
He has passed behind the veil. But there never will be a person in this dispensation enter into the celestial glory without his approbation. Elder Bruce and McConkie said, And thus, for this dispensation of grace, we come to Joseph Smith. He was called of God to reveal anew the doctrines of salvation. He was called of God to stand as the Lord's legal administrator, dispensing salvation to all men. Repeat, all men in the last days. Christ is the true vine. Joseph Smith is the chief branch for our day. And thus all men, every living soul who has lived or shall live on earth between the spring of 1820 and that glorious future day when the Son of God shall return to reign personally on earth, all men in the latter days must turn to Joseph Smith to gain salvation. Why? The answer is clear and plain. Let it speak with seven thunders. He alone can bring them the gospel. He alone can perform for them the ordinances of salvation and exaltation. He stands, as have all the prophets of all the ages in their times and seasons, in the place and stead of the Holy One in administering salvation to men on earth. President Brigham Young said, How are you going to get your resurrection? You will get it by the president of the resurrection pertaining to this generation, and that is Joseph Smith, Jr. Hear it all, ye ends of the earth. If you ever enter into the kingdom of God, it is because Joseph Smith let you go there. This will apply to Jews and Gentiles, to the bond and the free, to friends and foes. No man or woman in this generation will get a resurrection to be crowned without Joseph Smith saying so. The man who was martyred in Carthage Jail, state of Illinois, holds the keys of life and death to this generation. He is the president of the resurrection in this dispensation. Mormon 3, 21 through 22. And also that ye may believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, which ye shall have among you. And also that the Jews, the covenant people of the Lord, shall have other witness besides him whom they saw and heard, that Jesus whom they slew was the very Christ and the very God. And I would that I would persuade all ye ends of the earth to repent and prepare to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And it hath become expedient that I should make a small record of the time that Lehi left Jerusalem, even down into the present time. I do make my record from the accounts which have been given by those who were before me, until the commencement of my day. I write unto you Gentiles, yea, I write unto all the ends of the earth, yea, unto you twelve tribes of Israel. And I write also unto the remnant of this people, I write unto you all, that ye may know that ye must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Yea, every soul must stand to be judged of your works, whether they be good or evil. That ye may believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, which ye shall have among you. And I would that I could persuade all ye ends of the earth to repent and prepare to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. President Gordon B. Hinckley testified that the Book of Mormon is another witness of Christ. This scripture of the New World is before us as an added witness of the divinity and reality of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the encompassing beneficence of his atonement, and of his coming forth from the darkness of the grave. Within these covers is found much of the sure word of prophecy concerning him who should be born of a virgin, the son of the Almighty God. There is a foretelling of his work among men, as a living mortal. There is a declaration of his death, of the lamb without blemish, who was to be sacrificed for the sins of the world. And there is an account that is moving and inspiring and true of the visit of the resurrected Christ among living men and women in the Western continent. The testimony is here to handle. It is here to be read. It is here to be pondered. And it is here to be prayed for with a promise that he who prays shall know by the power of the Holy Ghost it is true and valid. How did Mormon follow Jesus Christ? How did Mormon's faith in Jesus Christ help or bless others? How can our faith help people we know? Write a verse-by-verse -verse analysis of Mormon 3, 17-22 and explain to a friend or family member the important points contained in these verses.